We've been going through a series that I called the And God series. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We just hear that. So many things happened. The disciples were doing so much, and God worked. Last week, we began to preach this message. They spoke the wonderful works of God. We broke it into two parts, so I'm going to finish that out tonight. They spoke the wonderful works of God. So Acts chapter 2 and verse number 5, the Bible says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Last week we gave you the introduction to that. This was amazing. People from all over the region, at least 12 different cultural regions came together and they heard the disciples preaching the wonderful works of God. It was incredible. They heard it in their own language. We know what happened. The Bible says that the power of God came upon the disciples and they spake in what we call tongues. That is languages. And as they spoke, people heard and understood in their very own languages. I can't tell you if it was that the disciples spoke in different languages and everybody heard it in their own language, or if they spoke in their own language and everybody heard it in their own language. I can't tell you exactly how it happened, but I can tell you it was a miracle that God did so that people could hear the wonderful works of God. I want to turn the corner a little bit from where we ended last week, and I want to apply it to us. We need people to speak the wonderful works of God. I mean, just this is the bottom line. This is simple. This is the message tonight. We need people who will speak the wonderful works of God. We had 12 disciples, and here they were speaking the wonderful works of God. You have probably even other disciples in this case, and they were speaking the wonderful works of God, and people heard, and, and people were convicted, and people made decisions, and people were saved. Tonight I want to talk about those people that were speaking the wonderful works of God. And I'm not going to go into details about who all the different disciples were. We talked about that a little bit this morning. What I want to talk about tonight is who we need. Who do we need in our time, in our culture, in our country, in our world? Who do we need to speak the wonderful works of God? I want to make this practical for all of us. I want to make this apply to all of us, so I hope that you listen, and I hope this will be helpful for you. I'm just going to give you several categories, and I hope that you'll take it, and if it applies to you, take it. If it doesn't apply to you, it's probably for the person next to you, all right? So uh, maybe they'll take it. You got that? Here we go. Several categories. I'm just going to give them to you. They're not in any order, but here we go. We need volunteers who will speak the wonderful works of God. Volunteers. Go to Acts chapter 8, if you would. We've got a man named Philip that we're going to see in a moment. Actually, uh, Acts chapter 8 isn't the reference for the story of Philip, but you, you kind of get an introduction to the way it was, the way life was when Philip comes on the scene here. Acts chapter 8, verse 3, the Bible says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. I want you to realize what this means. Saul, this is the Saul who later became Paul, but as, as much of a faithful disciple Paul was of God before he was saved, he was a faithful follower of, of the Jews' religion against Jesus Christ. He was very zealous, and, and the Bible says he would go into every house, and calling out or hailing the men and women, committed them to prison. I can't tell you exactly what it was like, but it might have been something like this. The knock at the door, somebody answering the door. They were afraid because they had an idea who it might have been. 
Actually, it probably wasn't that knock. It was probably the, you know, that's the, that's the you're in trouble knock. They open the door, and they see Saul or one of his men, his henchmen, as they might have called him, one of the people that they were afraid of. And as they would say, who here in this house is a Christian? Or who here in this house is a follower of Jesus Christ? He would call out, he would hail men and women. As he found out that they were Christians, he would take them and he would commit them to prison. Just understanding this situation, understanding this, this setting. If you were in the house and he asked you, are you a Christian or are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You've got a choice. You can say, no, I'm not. I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. And be in the same category that Peter was when he denied Christ. Or you could say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And if that was the case, Saul would take you, and the Bible says he would commit you to prison. Later on in his writings, we realize that many of the people that he took and he imprisoned were killed. Some of them possibly even in the Colosseums as the wild animals came, as the people cheered. We hear that story and we think, wow, that was, that was so long time ago. I didn't even think of putting this in my notes, but I came across this illustration yesterday. With ISIS going across the Middle East, uh, so many stories came out, awful stories. One of the stories that I read, I just read it yesterday, and I didn't even put it together, and I wasn't even planning on mentioning this. Twelve Christians in, in the path of, of where ISIS was, I don't remember exactly the city that they were in, they had been Muslim. And they are Muslims who had converted to Christianity. The law is that you are not allowed to convert to Christianity or else the punishment according to their interpretation of, of their law, the Sharia law, is death. Eleven of them were adults. Two of them were women. One of them was, a, I believe, was an 11-year-old boy. All of these, the same exact thing happened as what Paul did. ISIS came and asked them to deny their faith and, and asked them, were you Muslims once? And they said yes. And, and they asked them, did you convert to Christianity? Now all they had to do was say no and they could go free. We're talking last year. And they said, yes, we converted to Christianity. Every one of them, a pastor, his son, other missionaries that were there. I mentioned a couple of them were ladies. The pastor's son was 11 years old. They took him and cut off his fingers and tortured him just a little bit at a time in front of his father last year, okay? This is in our time trying to get his dad to say, okay, I recant. I, I, I will become a Muslim again. I will not follow Jesus Christ again. But he never said that. Eventually, half of them were crucified. In mockery of their Savior. The other half were beheaded. As they were beheaded, right up to the very end, they were singing, praising God. We hear stories like that, and we think, oh, that was the Middle Ages. That, that's what happened when the, the Catholic Church was doing all this stuff. And, well, no, no, no. This is modern times. This is, what the, this is what Saul was doing. Why even tell the story? We read it, and we, okay, okay, okay. This was real. These are real people really dying for their faith. When all that was happening, verse 4, the Bible says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. What happened? These weren't the apostles. These weren't the 12 people that had followed Jesus. These were the people who had been saved. Maybe even some of them on the day of Pentecost. We don't know the details, but the Bible says that these people, they were scattered abroad because they knew if they stayed in Jerusalem, if they stayed in these cities where the persecution was happening, if they stayed, they would die. So they left. They ran for their lives. And what did they do as they were running for their lives? They went everywhere preaching the word. These were not full-time preachers. These were not people who the church had sent out as missionaries. These were just volunteers. Volunteers. People that just said, 
I believe in God. I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I am going to go somewhere, and when I go that place running for my life, I'm going to tell somebody else about my Savior. We need volunteers who will speak the wonderful works of God. In Acts chapter 11, verse 9, you've got a continuation of that story. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word. What I see here is I see a group of people who are not paid, who are not full-time, who are not sent by the church, but they are going and they as volunteers are preaching the word. That's you, that's me, that's, that's anybody that just says, God, I, I believe it's important enough that I'm going to go and I'm going to preach the word. One of them was named Philip. He was a deacon that preached wherever God wanted him to go. God wanted Philip to preach in Samaria. So he preached in Samaria. I want you to remember the Jews didn't go to Samaria. Remember, they would walk around Samaria. It was strange that Jesus went into Samaria and met the, the a woman of, at the well in Samaria. It was, it was not normal for them. But the Holy Spirit said to Philip, I want you to go into Samaria and preach. And he went into Samaria and he preached. Then God wanted him to go preach near Gaza. So he preached near Gaza. You can still hear about Gaza in the news. If you watch much news, if you watch any news about Israel or the Middle East, Gaza is still in the news. You've got the Gaza Strip. You've got rockets being fired in. This is where Philip was. God said, I want you to go preach down there. So Philip went and he preached near Gaza. That's where he met the Ethiopian eunuch. That's where Acts chapter 8 comes in and he shares the gospel with him and, and this Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. And as soon as he baptized this Ethiopian eunuch, God miraculously moved him to Azotus. How many of you ever heard of Azotus? Well, if you read this chapter, you probably have, but you probably can't point to it on a map. I don't know that I can point to it on the map, but I'll tell you where it was. Azotus was about 30 miles from where he was in Gaza. This story is impressive. Philip just volunteers. He goes out and he preaches. The Holy Spirit says, I see a man willing to serve me, and so I'm going to tell him where to go, and he goes. And, he, and then God says, I, I, he's, he's serving me. I'm going to tell him where to go. He goes down to Gaza. He meets the, this Ethiopian eunuch. And after the Ethiopian eunuch gets baptized, as soon as they come out of the water, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, took Philip and moved him about 30 miles. Just transported him. It, it was like one of those portals where you just go through and you're instantly somewhere else. Okay, those don't really exist except in science fiction movies. This is, God just takes Philip, moves him about 30 miles. Now, one mile would have been impressive. 30 miles. He just takes him and he moves him. And here's just a simple lesson that you could take from this. God can do great things when people just say, God, I'm willing for you to use me. If you'll just volunteer and say, God, I'd love to speak the wonderful works of God, would you just let God use you? When you give yourself to God as a volunteer, he might just do something amazing with you. Listen, we need men. We need women. We need boys. We need girls who will speak the wonderful works of God. That's all of us. Just volunteer to do it. Just do it. Let's speak the wonderful works of God. Not only do we need volunteers to speak the wonderful works of God, but we need full-time Christian workers who will speak the wonderful works of God. Not just volunteer, but somebody that would say, I want to do this as a life calling. I will do this, God. If you want me to do it, I am willing to do it. If you call me, I will do it. And I will do this full time. I will do this as a career. I will spend my life speaking the wonderful works of God. We need volunteers, but we also need full-time Christian workers who will do that. In 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul says to Timothy, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here's what happened. Paul invested heavily in a young man named Timothy. We found out last week that he's between, was it 30 and 40 years old? Is that what we decided? Based on Google, right? Um, so Google knows everything. Um, Timothy, between 30 and 40, he's a young man. We don't know how old he was, just a guess. Paul invests in him. And he, he teaches him, and he tra Timothy travels with Paul, and he may have even been in prison with Paul at one point. Timothy became a pastor. Let me talk to you about 
pastors just for a moment. I have a few statistics here. There's a whole bunch. Of, you know, they do a lot of studies on pastors, like, like lab animals. It, it's, it's crazy. There's, there's all these studies and statistics and how depressed they are and you know, all, all this. It's amazing how many pastors are, are really, really depressed. It's just stuff that, that goes on. Um, but let me give you some statistics. I mentioned this last week. I'm going to give it to you again. In 1968, 55% of all Protestant pastors were under the age of 45. 55%, most of them, more than half, were fairly young. So the majority of church leaders were in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s. That was 1968. You know what else happened in 1968? Okay, not, not a, I'm sure a lot happened. I wasn't around, I can't tell you. I came around a few years after that. Around that time, Nearly every state, the largest church in that state was an independent Baptist church. During the time, the late 60s, early 70s, churches like ours had bus routes, six, seven, eight hundred people. There are churches in town. I still see their old buses in junkyards that ran eight, nine buses. People were being saved. Churches were growing. It was an amazing thing. And that is the time where the majority of preachers were in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Most of us in here aren't going to remember that. Some of you, you might. Now, there are more, more full-time senior pastors who are over the age of 65 than under the age of 40. It's flipped over. There are more pastors past what the world would call retirement age. When you're in the ministry, you don't retire, you refire. You, know, you just go and go and go and go. I'd rather rust out than, no, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Is, is, that, is that how that one goes? Um, over 65 is the majority, of, the more, let me say it right, more pastors over the age of 65 than under the age of 40. I say all that to say this. We need a whole lot more Christian men to surrender to God's call to preach. There's a whole lot less men who are saying yes to God's call to preach. A whole lot less men now than there were in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. We need Christian ladies who are willing to be a pastor's wife. Now, every Christian ought to give God first choice at their career. I believe this with all my heart. Every Christian should say, God, you have first choice. Now, we mentioned volunteers already. Beyond that, if we were to say, God, if you'll use me, I will do anything. I will go anywhere. I, I will serve you any way you want me to be. If you'd simply call me to serve you, I would do it. Could you tell God that? I remember. I, 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 God called me to preach when I was 10. I went to Bible college. I was serving in ministry. I was teaching, I was coaching basketball and football and doing the yearbook and the Christmas program. I was doing so, I was busy and I was enjoying it, but I remember telling God, God, I want to preach. God, I want to preach. God, would you let me preach? I, I remember digging post holes in the backyard so we can build a fence. Joshua was just about to be born. I remember digging these post holes. The clay was so thick, you'd have to dig it out of the post hole digger each time because it's just the, the clay there in Texas and, and uh, it's the worst place to build a fence, except maybe in the mountains where there's rocks, right? Miguel was just always digging in the holes there. I was digging, and I was thinking, God, if you just call me to preach. God, if you'll just call me to preach, I'll do it, would you? Now, he'd already called me to preach, but I was wanting to pastor. I was wanting to do, just, I wanted to do what I'm doing now. And I remember just digging and praying, God, would you, if you call me to pastor, I'd do it. And I just remember, and tears coming down my face, saying, I'm willing to do it. Would you please call me? Would you please call me? And I stopped, and I said, I guess that's what you're doing, isn't it? And I realized what was going on. And God put in my heart, Listen, if you would just say, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. And, and be willing to, to do what God wants you to do. We need more men. If God calls you to preach, you need to do it. That's just plain and simple. You know, there's a lot of us, a lot of Christians. And here's, here's my question. Is God calling less people to preach or is it just less people are saying yes? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe, maybe both, I don't know, but I don't know that God changed. 
There's a world out there that needs to be saved. There's Christians that need to grow. There's marriages that need to, be, need to be rescued, helped together. If God calls you to preach, just do it. God may call you if you're a young man. God led Timothy to the ministry from a young age. God may call you if you're an adult. I love the story of Peter. God called Peter to preach. Peter was an adult with a very successful career in the food service industry. Right? He's a fisherman. He had a successful career. And right in the middle of his career, God, Jesus comes to him and says... Peter, follow me, leave the nets, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Right in the middle of his career, and he takes him and, and he leaves his nets behind. Jesus changed Peter's career from fisherman to preacher. In 2015, two years ago, it's estimated that over 10,000 American churches closed their doors. 10,000 churches, and not all Baptist churches, but all churches, 10,000 in one year, closed. That's a lot of churches to close down. Another estimate is this. A recent survey estimated that close to 3,300 people are quitting church every day in America. Every day. 3,300 people, that's just the statistic, leave church and stop going to church every day. Well, something's going on. The fastest growing religion in America is no religion. The second fastest growing, uh, that, that is this. The, the, if you were to say, get a bunch of people together and say, what religious group are you? The fastest growing group is the one that says, I don't have a religion. The second fastest growing group in America, you might be able to guess it, is Islam. First fastest growing group is the, I don't have a religion. That's the group that there's more people joining that group than any other group. The second fastest growing religion, Islam. The third fastest growing religion in America is a group of other religions. You wouldn't know most of these, but you'll, here's a few that you'd recognize. The Baha'is, the Jains, the Sikhs, the Taoists, a lot of smaller religions. Christianity is expected to decline from 78% of the over, overall population. That was seven years ago in 2010. It's supposed to expect it to decline from 78% down to 66% by 2050. That's, that's, that's going down. I'm, I'm saying all this to say we need not only volunteers to preach the wonderful works of God, to speak the wonderful works of God, we need full-time Christian workers to speak the wonderful works of God. In Ezekiel chapter 22, 30, I love this verse. This is God... Uh, describing the situation, he said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I was looking, God says. There was a lamb that I was going to destroy because of their wickedness, and God says, I was looking for somebody, anybody in that land that would, would stand in the gap that would that'd keep me from destroying it. And God says, I didn't find anybody. We need people. We need men of God. We need preachers. We need ladies who would stand behind a man of God and say, I am going to stand in the gap. We need full-time Christian workers who would speak the wonderful works of God. We need volunteers to speak the wonderful works of God. We need full-time workers to speak the wonderful works of God. And we need Christians who will speak the wonderful works of God locally. I'll give you some different categories. This one's a pretty quick one, but, quick one, but let me give you some numbers. Ladies, Albuquerque has 10 Walmarts. If you were depressed before about churches declining, you could be happy now. There's 10 Walmarts in Albuquerque. I said that to ladies. I guess men spend as much time at Walmarts probably too. They just don't like it as much. I went to Walmart yesterday. I enjoyed my time. The Janessa and I, we went there. We bought a whole pack of ramen noodles. I mean like a case of ramen noodles. We passed out probably 50, 60 tracks while we were at Walmart. It's open. There's people everywhere, and you can give them a track and tell them about the church. We invited a whole bunch of people to church there. But beyond that, there's 14 public high schools, 16 charter high schools, seven large private high schools, 29 middle schools, and 88 elementary schools. APS, by itself, has 84,000 students, 84,000 young people in our school system 
in our city. We need Christians who will speak the wonderful works of God right here. Let's find a way to talk to them about the wonderful works of God. UNM has about 30,000 students. CNM has another about 30,000 students. 60,000 students looking for someone to tell them what they believe. A lot of them wide open and professors just pumping trash into their heads. We can reach them. We need to speak the wonderful works of God, and we need people that will do it locally. You know, the, the idea here is we think, God, if, if I say yes to you and I'll speak the wonderful works of God, you're going to send me to Bulgaria or Albania or a, one of the stands, Kazakhstan or Pakistan, or, and, and I don't want to go to any one of those. So, well, wait a minute. We've got a whole mission field right here. We need Christians who will speak the wonderful works of God locally. We need Christians who speak the wonderful works of God other places. Now, when I say other places, I mean anywhere else besides locally. You know, there's a whole lot of other places besides Albuquerque. You've probably been to some of those. We sang a song for our marriage retreat one time. I've been everywhere, man. And we named all these kind of places all over the, all over the country. We need, as a church, to send people out from our church who can speak the wonderful works of God other places. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, the Bible says, How shall they preach except they be sent? Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an amazing passage that is. But right after that, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? This is a challenge to our church because we need Christians who will speak the wonderful works of God other places. In order to make that happen, we need to send them. So what do we need to do? We need to train them. We need to train those people who can go out from here and go somewhere else and speak the wonderful works of God. You know, the wonderful works of God isn't just how to be saved. I hope you understand that. That is, that is that's the starting point, telling somebody how they can trust Jesus Christ as their Savior because they don't, they don't get that. They, they, they spend eternity separated from God and hell. But the wonderful works of God, there is so much to the Christian life that we need people that are telling people about it. We're missing out. We need Christians to be trained, and we need to train them. And then we need to support them. Let me ask us a question. If every church was sending laborers into the field just like our church is, would anyone be sent out? I want all of us to just stop and think about that for a minute. We've been here for 14 years. If we sent out, if every church in America, in the world, sent out preachers and sent out missionaries and sent out people speaking the wonderful works of God, if every church in the world sent out people like we're sending out people would we be starting any churches? Would we be reaching any people? Would we be helping the marriages? Would we be discipling people? Listen, we're failing in this area. And I'm not, I'm not browbeating y'all about this. I'm just saying, hey, listen, church, us, us. We need to train more people. We need to send more people. We need to let more people know and help more people to realize there's a lost world that needs a Savior and, and we need to get behind them. Listen, teachers, when you look at your Sunday school class, don't just see kids that are sitting there. I want you to look beyond them. Think about where they can be in 10 years or 50, 15 years. Try to see the adults that they will be. You teach a group of four or five-year-olds or 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds or sixth graders or, or, or high schoolers. As, as, as we're teaching these kids, let's don't, don't get frustrated with where they're at and don't just see them where they're at, but see them where they could be and let's think about sending them. In Acts chapter 13, if you want to turn there, because we're in the book of Acts, it shouldn't take just a second. Acts chapter 13, you see a church sending out some people. Acts 13, verse 1, Now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. A, a, a group of these people that are listed, Acts chapter 13, now in verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. 
And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And thus begins the missionary journeys of Paul. Asia is reached because a church sent out two men. Paul and Barnabas are sent out as missionaries. The first record that we have of a church sending out these missionaries. Here's a question for you. If the Holy Spirit led our church to send you out as a missionary, would you go? Okay, don't get scared. It's like when the preacher would call you up to pray for the offering. My preacher would always call us up to pray for the offering without even giving us any notice. It's like, <gasps> you know, heart attack. <clears throat> God's not going to lead the church to send somebody out that he hasn't already called. So I guess the real question here is, would you go if God called you? Would you go across town if God called you? We need another church across town. We need about 50 churches across town. Would you go to another state if God called you? Would you serve God anywhere that God called you? Now, until you can say yes to all those questions, God's not going to be able to use you very much anywhere. Can you say yes? I'll, I'll do that. God, if you'd call me across town and I'll serve you across town, I'd do that. And God, if you'd call me to another state, yes, I'd do that. If you'd call me to, to another country, if you'd call me to another continent, if you'd call me to another planet, I don't think you'd do that. But God, anywhere you would call me, I would go. I'm willing to go. Until you are willing, and you would say, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. God really is not going to be able to use you anywhere. God needs willing people who will speak the wonderful works of God anywhere he sends them. Across town, across the world. We need moms and dads who will speak the wonderful works of God at home. This is going to apply to all of us. I want you to listen quick because I'm just about out of time. Yes, we need volunteers. and Yes, we need full-time Christian workers. and We need people who speak the, words, the works of God locally. And we will need people who will speak the works of God somewhere else. But we need moms and dads who will speak the wonderful works of God at home. I wish every mom understood the power of her influence. 1 Timothy 5.14 is one that a lot of people would like to cut out of the Bible right now. I will therefore that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Moms, if you just understood the power of your influence. We live in a culture where we just assume that moms and dads are both supposed to work and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to make it happen. And, and I, I know that in some cases you have to. I understand that. I understand that. I understand that in a case of a, a single mom, there's, there's really not another option. And that's, that's what you've got to do. But listen, if that isn't something that you absolutely have to do, mom, if you'd understand the power that you have, to speak the wonderful works of God at home to your kids. If you have that opportunity, thank God and, and thank your husband that he's made that possible. When I was making less than $400 a week, my wife and I decided to live off my salary so my wife could stay at home with our kids. We weren't making much. and In fact, we were looking at a house one day. We didn't have any kids yet. We were looking at a house that was a little bit above our, our, uh, the amount we'd be willing to pay. And it was kind of in an old neighborhood. It was kind of a run-down house. And we looked at it, and we came back. And uh, Actually, as we were standing in the kitchen, the realtor asked me what I did. And I said, well, I'm a school teacher. And we had told him what my income was. And then he asked my wife, he said, what, what, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I, uh, I, I'm a homemaker. I work from home. I'm, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. And he looked at her, and he said, well, you need to get a job. That was the solution. We didn't get that house. We ended up getting a house that cost about $30,000 less. It was a little duplex about 20 miles out of town. But God bless that. God bless that in such, in such a huge way. Don't let the daycare raise your kids. Don't let the public school and after school program raise your kids. Because your kids will become a lot like the people who train them. If they spend all their time... With kids their age, your kids are going to become like the kids their age. It's, it's one of the, the negatives of spending a whole lot of time around your age group. 
If you send your kids to fourth grade and they're always a fourth grade or they're, they're daycare and they're always a daycare and they're always around this group of people, that group of people is what they're going to become like. That, that's, that's why it's a great idea to get them into Sunday school, get them into the youth group, get them, get them into church, get them somewhere where it's not just kids their age, but there's an adult around, somebody that they can learn from that's not the exact same age that they are. What are the average kids their age like? What do they watch on TV? What music do they listen to? What video games do they play? What words do those kids that your kids are always around, what words do they hear coming out of the mouth of their parents? And let me ask you this, is that what you want your kids to be like? Just keeping your kids at home isn't the answer either, though. They need to hear about the wonderful works of God from their parents. They need to hear the wonderful works of God from their brothers and their sisters. A great example in the Bible, we won't turn there, but in the Bible, Hannah trained her son for God, and her son served God the rest of his life. What a great example. We need moms and dads who will speak the wonderful works of God at home. And a lot of it, and a lot of time speaking the wonderful works of God at home. Now, it can be fun. You can enjoy time together at home and you can be speaking the wonderful works of God, whether it's direct or whether it's through actions or it's just showing the love of God through, through yourself. But a lot of time is necessary. We need Christians who speak the wonderful works of God to different cultures right here in our city. And I'm going to finish with this. The disciples reached into at least 12 cultures by speaking the wonderful works of God. The wonderful works of God transcend culture. It doesn't matter what culture you identify with, God's word will change your life. It doesn't matter what culture you come from. You still need God's love and forgiveness. And it doesn't matter what culture you fit into. God loves you just as much as he loves everybody else. He loves you as much as he loved the thief on the cross. God loves you as much as he loves Peter and James and John. He loves you as much as he loves Mary Magdalene, that sinful woman that he cast the devils out of. God loves you as much as he loves Saul of Tarsus, who hunted and killed Christians, but was also saved by God's amazing grace. God loves you as much as that Samaritan woman that Jesus met at the well. She'd already had five husbands. God loves you just as much as her. God loves every person from every culture, with every shade of earth-toned skin that exists on our planet. God loves everyone. doesn't matter what culture they're from. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the children of the world, and we need to love them too. And not just the cute little children, but the not-so-cute adults as well. And it doesn't matter what culture somebody comes from. We need to love them. And we need to speak to them the wonderful works of God. If we're reaching our community, then our church should be percentage-wise a representation of our community. Let's do some math here real quick, okay? I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of numbers, but I want you to think percentage-wise. If we are representing our community, our church should represent our community. Percentage-wise, we should match what our community is. We should have old people and young people because our community has old people and young people. We should have light people and dark people because our community has light people and dark people. We should have college-educated adults and adults who haven't even finished high school yet. We should have people who are comfortable speaking in English and people who are comfortable speaking in Spanish because that's what our community is. We should have married couples and single parents. Our church should always represent our community. We must make sure to never allow our church to cater to only one culture or one type of person. Don't ever let our church become that. Don't ever let our church just try to reach one ethnicity, one group. And I don't say race because God made one race. It's the human race and we're all humans. God loves everyone just the same. But different cultures, sometimes one is shunned and one is accepted. Listen, our church should always do everything we can to speak the wonderful works of God to every culture that's in our community. doesn't matter what they look like or where they come from or what they talk like. Let's speak the wonderful works of God to them. Here's another way to say this. Don't ever exclude one culture or type of person from our church. You need to know that that's what I believe. You need to know that's what the Bible teaches. And I hope that becomes your heart. Every culture. 
Every person ought to be spoken the wonderful words of life. Because for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, God loves people from foreign cultures too. Hope you get this. America grew by 27 million people between 2000 and 2010. Okay, out of those 27 million people, 16 million of them were immigrants entering America. The rest were born here. People are coming to America from around the world, and they're bringing their religions with them. So what do we do? Let's speak to them the wonderful works of God. Non-Christian places of worship declined. Between 1998 and 2006, can you picture that? 1998 and 2006, if it was a place of worship and it wasn't Christian, the amount of them went down between, between those, that period, between 1998 and 2006. It went down from 16,000 to 13,000. But in 2012, it doubled to 26,000. Let me explain it. Non-Christian places of worship would be anything that's not Catholic or Protestant or anything close to that. This would be Islam. This would be um, Jewish. This would be anything like the Eastern religions. So uh, over, up till 2006, they went down. The number of those places were going down. But in 2012, it doubled, 26,000. Mosques between 2000 and 2011 grew from 1,200 to 2,100, just about doubled in 10 years. There are so many people coming to our country that believe differently than we believe. So what do we do? Let's speak to them the wonderful works of God. Let's make it a point to go ahead and talk to them about our Savior. We might disagree on the politics of whether or not it should be happening, but the fact is it's happening, and we need to reach them. And we need to speak the wonderful works of God to everybody, regardless of their cultural background or religion. Ladies, it's okay to talk to a Muslim lady wearing the traditional headdress and burqa or whatever it is. It's okay. I talked to uh, Brother Stephen Trell. He's a missionary to, to Muslims in, in Jordan right now. He wrote this article. Actually, I think his wife wrote this article. It was amazing about looking into a woman's eyes and just seeing her eyes. That's all because that's all she could see. The rest was covered up in, 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 in the Muslim cl clothing that the woman would wear. But looking into her eyes, and she wrote this article about in her eyes, I saw the same things that I deal with. Ladies, it's okay. Listen, talk to them. Uh, give her a tract. Give her a smile. Talk to her about her kids and her family. She's got a lot of the same things going on in her life as you do. Let's, let's speak the wonderful works of God to people of other cultures. They don't have to be just like us to, to, to talk to them about God and tell them about our church. Make, make friends with them. Spend time with them. It's okay to, listen, this is going to blow you away. It's okay to invite them to your house to eat dinner. Now be careful with some of the, the cultural things. Men, men, it's not usually a good idea to talk to a woman uh, from, from, uh, from uh, Arabic or if, they're, if they're wearing the Muslim type of a thing. Uh, we learned that the hard way. We went and visited somebody. We didn't realize we were just trying to share the gospel with them. And she said, if, if my husband found out that you were here, he'd be very, very mad at me. We want to be careful. But let's, let's not stop sharing the gospel and speaking the wonderful works of God. You know, one of the wonderful works of God is not just sharing the gospel. Showing them the love of our Savior. Their, their holy book doesn't show a loving Savior. Whenever they see Jesus, it changes everything. There's one more thing, and it's another culture among us that we need to reach. I know there's a lot more cultures we need to reach, but I want to give you this one because it's important. Some people call them millennials. <laughs> I mentioned them this morning, a different culture. Some people call them young adults. They're a strange culture, just like you were a part of strange culture when you were a young adult. Let me give you just some statistics about millennials. I forget the exact, the exact age group, but um, like uh, up for like, a, a, I think it's 20 to 35, right around, what is it, Brother Ryan? 25 to 35, that 10-year segment, 25-year-olds to 35-year-olds. They're called millennials. What's the one under that, younger than that? Does anybody know? There's, a, there's the baby boomers, and then it kind of goes down, and then there's a, I'm Generation X. Generation X, we got blisters on our thumbs from playing Nintendo and things like that. Um, then there's the, the millennials, Generation Y is in there somewhere. Gener the millennials, 
They're a big misunderstood generation. But the reason I say that is this. Let's just speak from generation to generation. Let's don't let the generation boundary keep us. Let's don't just reach people like us, is what I'm trying to say. There's some young people that would really love to know the truth. Millennials, though. More than 60% of non-Christian millennials, 25 to 35, have never read the Bible. If they're not saved, over half of them have never read the Bible. When they see someone reading the Bible in public, this is what they assume. If they're between 25 and 35, and there's a certain percentage for each of these, I won't bore you with the statistics. If they were to see you, if a millennial, a young person, young adult was to see you reading your Bible in public, let me tell you what the surveys say that they are thinking. One, they would first think that you're politically conservative. The second thing that they would think is that they don't have anything in common with you just because they see you reading the Bible. Just because they see you reading the Bible, they'd think, oh, that person is different than me. This is definitely a cultural divide, something that we can speak the wonderful works of God to. They would, if they saw you reading your Bible, they would think that you're old-fashioned. They would think this. They would think that you're trying to make a statement or be provocative. A large percentage would just think, because you're reading your Bible in public, that you're doing it on purpose to provoke them, to upset them. Whether you are or not, that's just the, the mentality, and that's just the, the, the generation they grew up in. Only 9% of non-Christian millennials would say that they feel curious about what's in the Bible when they see someone reading it. If you were to go out to the park and say, you know, I'm going to read my Bible so these young people going by would maybe stop by and ask, you know, what are you doing? What are you reading there? Only 9% would be curious. The rest would be everything else that we just mentioned to you. We need to speak the wonderful works of God to these young adults. I gave you a lot of categories tonight. Here's the bottom line. We need people who will speak the wonderful works of God. Whether it's volunteer, whether it's full-time ministry, whether it's somewhere far away, whether it's local, whether it's right in our own homes, whether it's to another culture right here in our city, whether it's to a different generation, we need people who will speak the wonderful works of God. Would you be one of those people? Would you be one of the people like here in Acts chapter 2 that they spoke the wonderful works of God and people got saved and lives were changed? The world was turned upside down because people like you spoke the wonderful works of God. Father, I pray that you would use this message. Just put it in our hearts. And Lord, if you want to call any one of us to serve you in any one of these ways, I pray that you'd do it. I pray that you'd give us a desire to speak the wonderful works of God. And they are wonderful to think just how wonderful you are. Wow, how wonderful, how wonderful your works are. Whether it's sharing the gospel or talking about faith, talking about your provision, anything that has to do with talking about your wonderful works, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that. I pray that you'd help us to speak your works.